many students forgot to put the extra electron in here that cesium had lost when it became ionised. Even though the iodine was clearly half a mole of iodine molecules here, some students still forgot to put half a mole of iodine molecules in the solid state. Many students forgot to write an equation for Hess's law before doing the actual calculation. Root A, which is the only arrow going in the anticlockwise direction, which is here, is equal to the sum of all of the other roots which are going in a clockwise direction. Arrow C is the enthalpy change of the atomization energy of iodine, so we need to isolate and rearrange the equation for C. You also, also had to had know, to know where, where these values here appeared, appeared in the Born Harbor cyclone. cyclone. So let's put them in now. So it's, so it's wise, wise to put the values, values in, in from, from the, the table, table and, and then, then underneath your rearrangement of Hess's law, put the values in, in from the from table, table once you've applied them to the Born Harbor cycle. It's useful, it's useful to give, to give the, final the final value, value a sign, sign so, so plus, plus 107, 107 because you're, you're atomizing, atomizing which requires energy to break, break the covalent bonds between the iodine atoms in an iodine molecule. So here, the closer the experimental value is to the calculated value, the closer to a perfect ionic model it is. And therefore, you can see there's only three kilojoules difference. So your answer would be that the bonding is close to a perfect ionic model. Some students here didn't realize that because you've been given the entropy data, you had to, as well as knowing the Gibbs free energy calculation, you had to know the equation for entropy change. It often makes sense to write the values below the equation so you're not making mistakes in the stoichiometry. So here, you had to multiply the entropy value by a half because you're forming half a mole of iodine molecules. So when you, when you carried out this calculation and show the calculation as well as the equation, so it's worthwhile remembering the units for entropy are in joules. So never forget that this needs to be converted either to kilojoules in the next step. Students who remembered that delta G equals delta H minus T delta S and a mark. And then all you needed to do was substitute in the values. So many students lost marks because they forgot to convert entropy into kilojoules by dividing by a thousand. And because entropy now has a positive value, it's shown that it's not feasible at 298 Kelvin. This question was answered really well. I think a lot of available students have remembered this from the AS. But what they must realise is that the MZ ratio, so there's a lot of marks lost with this, when you're carrying out electrospray, is to remember that the actual value of the molecular mass is more one more because it's picked up a proton which increases its mass by one. So the answer here should have been 555 five, five because it's always one more than the mass because it's actually gained a proton. It's always good in a time of flight question to find out what information you have before starting the calculation. So downside, it's, it's always good to write down the variables and the information you have. So here we're trying to find the mass of one mole of molecules. So we're asked to find the relative molecular mass. The mass that you'll come out with here is the mass of one single molecule that has been ionized.
it was surprising the number of students that didn't realise that velocity equals distance over time. You got a mark for saying that. It was also surprising the number of students who weren't able to rearrange the k equals half mv squared to get mass on its own. So make sure you can do basic rearranging of equations. Practice rearranging equations because one of these will definitely come up in the real A level. Practice and practice and practice. So remember, this is the mass of one single molecular iron. We're asking to find one mole, the mass of one mole of these ions. So the mass of one mole, sorry, the mass of one single iron, it's quite simple to do in your calculator, is this equation here. At this point, you decide, do I need to times by Avogadro constant or do I need to divide by Avogadro constant? Well, this is the mass of one single molecular iron. And therefore, to get the mass of one mole of ions into kilograms, we need to be using the Avogadro constant. So if we times it by the Avogadro constant, we will arrive at the mass of one mole, the relative molecular mass of one mole of those molecules. So notice here, we've multiplied by the Avogadro constant, then by a thousand. This is to get the mass of one mole of molecules, and that's to convert it from kilograms into grams. So the relative molecular mass of this particular iron, uh, one mole of these ions, comes out to a hundred and 69.3 sig figs grams. Unfortunately, even though you were given a heads up that group seven was going to appear on the mock, a lot of students had not looked at the reactions of the halide ions with concentrated sulfuric acid. So it's worthwhile remembering that as you go down the group of the halide ions, the reducing power of the halide ions increases and the concentrated sulfuric acid as it goes down therefore behaves as an oxidizing agent. The halide ions are potentially reducing agents. The iodide ion is the most powerful reducing agent because its electron is furthest away, therefore least tightly held, and therefore it can donate electrons much more readily. Therefore, in this case, the sulfuric acid is behaving as an oxidizing agent. However, because the fluoride ion and the chloride ion are so small, they're really, really weak reducing agents because they won't release the outer electron. So sulfuric acid cannot oxidize fluoride or chloride ions. It will simply have an acid-base reaction. When it gets to bromide ions, the bromide ion is a powerful enough reducing agent to reduce the sulfur in the sulfuric acid and so is the iodide ion. All that's happened in this reaction is that the sulfuric acid, because it's a more powerful bronsted Lowry acid, forces a proton onto the chlorine and that forms hydrogen chloride gas. This is entropy. And because hydrogen chloride is a gas, there is more entropy on this side and that escapes as a gas. And therefore, this reaction continues to move forward. It's the only reason it happens. And therefore, the role of the sulfuric acid is as an acid. Either a Bronsted-Lowry acid, which is a proton or H plus donor. It does exactly the same with fluoride ions and chloride ions. Here, uh, you were allowed to have two moles of NaCl forming two moles of HCl and Na2SO4. So now, as we go to bromide and iodide, because these are more powerful reducing agents, we now get the halide ion becoming the halogen and losing its outermost electron. Now, in order to deduce equations for these, all you need to know is that bromide goes to bromine and that this, in the sulfuric acid, the H2SO4 
is reduced from sulfur plus 6 down to SO2 plus 4. It's been reduced down from plus 6 to plus 4. So a way of remembering this is that you get brown fumes and a choking gas. So the sulfur dioxide is a nasty choking gas. If you know these two half equations then it's quite possible to balance the overall equation without trying to remember the overall equation from scratch. So if we now write out the two half equations, once you're able to construct the two half equations, so remember that in H2SO4, you've got four oxygen on this side, so we need to balance by adding another two waters. We've now got a disparity of four hydrogens on this side, so we add two H plus and two E's. So you simply cancel out the electrons and add the two equations together. Choking gas isn't classed as an observation, but here you're getting bromine, which at room temperature, or as it's warm, you would get brown fumes of observed. So in this case, the role of the sulfuric acid is an oxidizing agent because it itself has become reduced. It's gone from plus six to plus four. And therefore the role of the sulfuric acid is an oxidizing agent. Next question was simply an AS, can you calculate the oxidation state of chlorine in two species? You know that the rules, hopefully, that sodium has got an oxidation state of plus one. We're trying to find chlorine and oxygen always, when it's combined, apart from peroxides, is minus two. So there are three lots of oxygen, so that's three times minus two, and the overall charge is zero. So Na plus one minus three is minus five. Sorry, so chlorine minus 5, overall charge is 0, so therefore chlorine has got an When an acid is added to any inorganic and you get an effervescence, you know it's a carbonate. You added silver to it, so the other cream precipitate had to be silver carbonate. You are expected to know that silver ions are Ag+. So many students fail to write down the ionic equation, which must always have state symbols. However, in the mark scheme, you got away without writing the state symbols. You may have been forgiven for not being able to write the conversion of D into G because we haven't done complex ions yet. However, you should really know that ammoniacal silver nitrate used in Tolland reagent, which was D, which is AGBr, 
you should know that when you're adding ammonia, concentrated ammonia, you're forming ammoniacal silver nitrate, which is AgNH3 two with a positive charge and your bromide ion is can boot it out so really this was a, a difficult question because we've not yet done complex ions even some really strong candidates still keep getting the bond angles wrong when they're showing molecules hydrogen bonding it's important to notice that the number of lone pairs on, on one molecule and the number of hydrogens available on the other molecule determines how many hydrogen bonds per molecule can be formed. It's imperative that the angle between the hydrogen on one molecule and the hydrogen bond from the lone pair on a neighbouring molecule is 180 degrees. It's linear. And that follows on with the neighbouring hydrogen as well. You must get this 180 degrees. And you must appreciate that the bond angle around the methanol molecule is also uh, based on a tetrahedron with two lone pairs repelling. To complete, the hydrogen, oh, to complete the hydrogen bonding, make sure you put the partial charges on the correct atoms. This is an AS question. In this question here, in terms of the intermolecular forces, some students waffled on forever and ever and ever to get their three marks. Remember, you do not have to write in continuous prose. You've mentioned that these are hydrogen bonds. They've not mentioned hydrogen bonds. So you've got a mark saying hydrogen bonds between ethanol molecules, whereas in methoxymethane, because it's nonpolar, they're simply van der Waals forces. If you suggested that there was a... A po polar, you would have got away with saying permanent dipole, dipole. However, the to get your third mark, you had to say that hydrogen bonds are the most, the stronger intermolecular force. More energy is needed to overcome. This question wasn't really read properly because a lot of students didn't read that in POCl3, the, mon the oxygen atom is attached to the phosphorus atom by a double bond. That uses two electrons from the phosphorus. So uh, you had to name the shape and suggest a bond angle for ClF4. So if we do POCl3, we know that the number of... So a double bond is treated the same as a single bond. So you can see here there are one, two three, four bonds. When you have four bond pairs, you should know that four pairs of electrons and no pairs rep re results in the most common shape, which is tetrahedral. So here we've got the phosphorus atom, the double bond oxygen, and four chlorines, sorry, three chlorines, and therefore the name of the shape, which is the most common shape, is tetrahedral. It's easy to work out the shape of ClF4 because we know that chlorine is in group 7. It's got four bonds. We need to add an electron for the negative charge. And when we add all of that up together, we can see that there are um, 12 electrons divided by 2, which is 6 pairs of electrons. So we have 6 pairs of electrons, but we only have 4 bonds. So that's 6 minus 4, which is 2 lone pairs. And when we've got 2 lone pairs, so we've got 6 pairs of electrons all together, so that's based on an octahedron with chlorine at the centre. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six we've got four bond pairs the lone pairs are going to get as far apart as possible as they can repelling all the bond pairs together so the name of the shape is square planar and the angle between each of these bonds is 90 degrees
A lot of people couldn't balance this equation because it does say an excess of ammonia. And when you did halogenoalkanes last year, you know that to avoid having a, a forming secondary and tertiary and quaternary amines, you have to have an excess of the ammonia. Now, because it was 1,2-dibromohexane, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, with two bromines, you know from last year, in order to replace one, one bromine with an ammonia, one of the ammonia molecules behaves as a nucleophile, and then you need a second ammonia to behave as a base. Well, this has got two bromines on, so therefore you needed four ammonia molecules, resulting in your diamine. So this bromine's been replaced by an NH2, and one, two, three, four, five, six, this bromine has been replaced by an NH2. But remember, two more of the ammonia molecules remove protons, so you're forming NH4Br, and there's two of them. If you look carefully at this question, all you needed to do was to put on the partial charges and your lone pairs. So here, there's a lone pair on our nitrogen here. The bromine is going to be slightly delta plus, and therefore this is the carbon that is being attacked by your nucleophile, and the bromine leaves. Now, in the next part, remember that when the ammonia attacks and the bromine leaves, the ammonia now has got four groups around it. And some of you forgot to put your, uh, your positive charge. So it's got one, two, three, four, five, and then your NH2 here. But here where the NH3 is attached, is N H H H from your N H three and therefore it's got a positive charge because it's now got four groups around it. And remember the second ammonia molecule now comes along and behaves as a base. And that then removes a proton and the hydrogen throws its electron in there. The cyclic secondary amine can only have six carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six. Start there again. One, two, three, four, five, six. How can it be formed? Well, don't think, think about it. The NH2 here could attack, the lone pair on the nitrogen there, could potentially attack this electron deficient carbon here. And it's going to have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. Just check your, your skeletal structure. One, two, three, four, five, six carbons. This is secondary amine because it's attached to two other carbons. So here again, you needed to remember from your S, AS and your A-level that amines can be made by two routes. The first route is with like the last one with halogenoalkane and ammonia, but that's not a good preparation because you get uh, secondary tertiary and quaternary amines formed. So the best way is to use nitriles. Now to convert a amine, uh, sorry, to convert halogenoalkane into a nitrile, you have to you state the reagent. You had to state the reagent. Cyanide is not a reagent. Cn minus is not a reagent you had to say either sodium cyanide or potassium cyanide. You can give the formula or the name, but a cyanide on its own is not a reagent. The potassium cyanide and sodium cyanide will dissolve in ethanol, and we need to dissolve it in ethanol, not water, not aqueous, because the water will also behave as a nucleophile. So the reagent is... The the potassium cyanide or sodium cyanide need to be dissolved in aqueous alcohol. They can't just be dissolved in water because that would act as a nucleophile. You cannot write cyanide. Full stop. For stage two, it's a reduction reaction as 
four atoms of hydrogen need to be added across the nitrile. The reducing agent cannot be NaBH4, but it can be LiAlH4, but the conditions mean it has to be dissolved in a non-polar solvent, so the condition is dissolved in ether. Or you could have had tin and conch HCl producing hydrogen gas. Very few students in the next question used illustrations. Even the brightest students here failed to use illustrations. It's so important that if you're answering a question on hydrogen bonding, intermolecular forces, explaining, comparing and contrasting, you draw diagrams of the molecules. Because the important thing here is to talk about the availability of the lone pair on the nitrogen atom. And you need to talk about the lone pair on the nitrogen atom comparing both molecules and it's more available in the stronger base. So the lone pair on the amino pentane, so draw the amino pentane, draw the nitrogen atom, show the lone pair. Again, students here failed to draw the structure of amino pentane, showing that on the carbon to which the nitrogen group is attached, there are two identical groups. So there aren't four different groups. So there is no chiral centre. If you did write this, you would say you need four different groups, not molecules, four different groups around a carbon atom. And you can see here, there are two ethyl groups on either side of the carbon. Here was a giveaway question. It was a bog standard empirical formula question. I'll walk you through it very quickly. So just to quickly walk you through the empirical calculation again, if you've got 100 grams, if 88.2% is carbon, then the rest 11.8% must be hydrogen. You then look at your periodic table to get the relative atomic masses, to get the amount, the number of moles, you divide the mass by the relative atomic mass. To get the ratio, you divide both by the smallest. So the ratio came out to 1 to 1.61. You cannot round 1.61 up or down. So you need to multiply it by both by a number until you arrive at a whole number. And this time you had to multiply by 5. So the molecular form, the empirical formula came out as C5H8. But it also told you that the empirical formula is the same as its molecular formula. You know it's got double bonds in it because it's got an alkene. And also you're told that it's not cyclic, but it's a branched hydrocarbon. So you know it's unsaturated. And therefore, if you draw the structure and it's branched, it's got five carbons. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. For five can't be that structure because it's branched. So if you take off one of those carbons and put it anywhere else, apart from carbon one and carbon five, this is the skeleton. So this is the skeleton here. And now to work out the number of double bonds, C5H8, it has to have two double bonds because if it had one double bond, it would be C5H10. So C5H8 suggests it's got two double bonds, so any double bonds anywhere would have sufficed. This was an AS type question on addition polymerization. So to work out your monomer from that was the, it makes up the addition polymer, you simply add a double bond where the repeating unit is, which is here. there. We can see that the stem of the name of this alkene is going to be but because there are four carbons. You have a double bond between carbon one and carbon two and a double bond between three and four. So the IUPAC name is but one, three, diene. In the prefix, A is used because after the placing of the double bonds, it's followed by a consonant. So buta 
one, three, die in. If it had been a single double bond, it would have been but three, in, but one, in. But because there are two, you need in the prefix to put an a, because it's followed by a suffix, uh, followed by a consonant. So we know that alkenes have geometric EZ isomers because of restriction of rotation about this bond. The repeating unit was therefore the integagen, the E isomer, so here the priority groups are on the same side. So you needed to simply draw this structure again with the priority groups on the opposite side. This question is a common one comparing addition polymers to condensation polymers. To get the mark, you had to mention that the carbon single bond carbon bond in addition polymers is non-polar. It was no good just saying there is n it's a non-polar molecule. You had to talk about the carbon single bond carbon being non-polar. At first glance, this question really baffled a lot of people because it wasn't in the usual AQA format where they give you the change in concentration and they give you the rate. In order to work out the rate, what you had to do was to use the initial concentration and the final concentration and then divide the change in concentration by the time to find out the rate of the reaction. So here you can see that we've simply worked out the change in concentration in experiment two. So two take away 1.4 divided by the time. So there's your change in concentration divided by the time. So the units are moles per dm cube per second. And the same for experiment three. Once you had the rates, it was then a, a case of just seeing how the concentration had changed from one experiment to another. So if we compare experiment one with experiment two, the concentration of P has changed from one to two. We've doubled the concentration of B and the rate has gone from 1.6 to 3.2. The rate has doubled. So if you double the concentration and you double the rate, we know it's first order with respect to P. What we now need to do to find the order with respect to changing the concentration of Q, we need to look at changing the concentration of Q whilst keeping P the same. Unfortunately, there is no experiment where that happens. So we look at experiments two and three, the concentration of P has gone down by a quarter and we've doubled the concentration of Q. But we already know that it's first order with respect to P. What's happened uh, between experiments two and three is that the rate has not changed. So the change in rate in experiment three divided by the change in the rate in experiment two is going to be proportional to the change in concentration of P in experiment 2 compared to 1. So you can see it's gone down by a quarter. Uh, so it's gone down by a quarter. And we know it's first order with respect to the change in concentration of P. So we'll put a little 1 there. Times by the change in concentration of Q. And it's gone from 1.25 to 2, it's gone up two times. And we don't know what the order is with respect to changing the concentration of Q. Since the rate in experiment 3 is the same as the rate in experiment 1, the change in rate is 1 because it's not changed at all. So a quarter to the power 1 is a quarter times 2 to the power x because we don't with this is the order with respect to q take this over to the other side 4 equals 2x sorry 4 equals 2 to the power x and therefore it must be second order with respect 
to the concentration of Q. All students needed to do in this one was to write a rate expression looking at the information given in the question. So second order with respect to the concentration of R, second order with respect to the concentration of X, and don't forget the rate constant. So you you were asked to you were given the initial rate of reaction, you were given the concentrations of R and S. So all you needed to do was rearrange it to get the rate equation and give the units. So it's a simple case of rearranging this to get K on its own. So take R squared, S squared below. So it's rate divided by the concentration of R divided by the concentration of S. Put in your values and the answer to three sig figs is 2.00 times 10 to, the nine, 10 to the power 4. Units, we'll just walk through the units quickly. So the units for rate on the top are moles per dm cubed per second, as given here. Units for concentration, moles per dm cubed squared times moles per dm cubed squared. Cancel out a moles and a dm cubed on the top on the bottom, so that now becomes moles per dm cubed. Multiply these brackets out, so that's moles times moles squared, which is moles cubed. dn to the minus 3 times dn to the minus 3 squared is to the 9. Bring that to the top so you change the powers seconds to minus one. Many students here fail to distinguish between mechanism and reaction type. Mechanism is either an electrophile, a nucleophile or a free radical. You know because it's benzene, it's electron rich in the middle and you've added a group on and remember there's a little hydrogen there. So this is attacked by electrophiles, the hydrogen gets replaced, so it has to be electrophilic substitution. To balance this equation, it's like when we did redox, we know it's a reduction reaction, and here we have two oxygens, and therefore to balance this on the other side, you need to add two H2Os. Now we have an excess of hydrogen on this side, so we've got four atoms of hydrogen here, and an extra two here. And if we're using a reducing agent, you are quite within your rights to put hydrogen in brackets, in which case it would be six. Or if you just use nickel and hydrogen gas, that would be three H2s. Students were disappointed with this if they'd revised their mechanisms because the first stage had already been done for you. So let's walk our way through this mechanism. It's important to show the lone pair of electrons because a lone pair has moved on, a pair of electrons has moved onto the oxygen, and therefore a negative charge. And therefore, if there's a negative charge, there must be a positive charge somewhere else to balance it out, because there is no overall charge on this. So don't forget the two charges. The lone pair comes down and reforms a double bond. So that curly arrow must be going to the middle of this bond. The carbon chlorine bond breaks. If you show the chlorine taking the hydrogen you actually get penalised, so don't do this. Remember, whenever an amine is present, one amine can behave as a nucleophile, and then a second amine can come along and behave, behave as a base. So a second amine comes along, and it's the second amine which behaves as a base, which takes off that hydrogen. So be really careful, don't do this. This next question, why ethanol chloride couldn't be used, a lot of people mistakenly said that ethanol chloride is toxic. But remember, when you, form, when you react with ethanol chloride, hydrogen chloride fumes are given off, which are harmful. Also, you could have said it was expensive. And also, they're really, really reactive, uh, ethanol Chloride is really, really reactive. It's a vigorous reaction. It's very exothermic, hard to control. So ethanoic anhydride is less reactive and it's less exothermic. You can see that in paracetamol, there is an OH group and you know that OH groups can act as nucleophiles which could react with the ethanol chloride. So the ethanol chloride could have formed an ester here. You also know that amine groups can behave as nucleophiles. So this could also have reacted with the acyl chloride. So your paracetamol 
as well as being acylated here, could have been acylated here and not attacking the NH2 or both of these groups because this OH here is a nucleophile and the nitrogen, the amine group is a nucleophile. So both of them could have been acylated. So either one of these structures, either or, would be formed. Um, in this question here, it said hydroquinone reacts with ammonium ethanoate and there were many students who didn't know the formula of the ethanoate ion. So ammonium ethanoate. A hydrogen is lost off the OH, sorry, an OH is lost here and a hydrogen in here. And an H2O from there, so there are two moles of OH. To start this very simple calculation, it was an easy AS calculation. You simply, first of all, for one mark, had to calculate the MR of paracetamol, which there is the molecular formula. And quite a few people couldn't do that, so you lost a mark. You then calculated the amount. There was an error carry forward if you said it's a one to one ratio, and you've got the amount. You've got the MR, so the num the mass is the number of moles times the MR, which should have been 182 kilograms. Noticed we haven't bothered converting the mass into grams because it would cancel out in the end anyway. It was a, a very, very easy question. You had an acid anhydride, and you know when an acid anhydride and alcohol reacts, they form an ester. So half of the acid anhydride is attacked by the alcohol um, and the rest of the acid anhydride comes away as the acid. So the name of the ester is ethyl from the alcohol and propanoate from the acid. You could start by here by drawing the two methyl esters that are formed for your biodiesel. So you know that biodiesel are methyl esters and your methyl esters have the structure um, from the fatty acid coming from the oil and then the methyl bit from your methanol is CH3. So therefore, the, the bit that comes from the fatty acid is this part here. And therefore, one of the methyl esters has the formula C19 and therefore, the length of this carbon chain must be C18. Here, the methyl ester has the formula CH3O. And then the rest of the carbon chain is going to be C double bond O. And the formula of this is also C. 19 H 36 but because one of the carbons has come from the methyl group that's going to be a C18 as well. So the methyl bit also uses three hydrogens so this carbon chain here is C8 C18 H34 take away three which is H32, 31. This carbon chain here, if we look at the methyl ester, it's taken away three hydrogens and a carbon, so it's now C18, H take away three, H33. And the ratio of them is two to one. So we now can draw our methyl, uh, our vegetable oil, because we know our vegetable oil is a triester. And our triester is always made up of a molecule of propan 1, 2, 3 triol, or as biologists like to call it, glycerol, joined to your free fatty acids. And these are the formula of the free fatty acids. These are the carbons and hydrogens. So they contain a C double bond O. So this is CH, C18. So the rest of the chain must be C17. H31 and there's two of these 
there's another C double bond of C17 H31. Finally, there is this methyl ester which must be more saturated. So that's C double bond of, and that is C17 H33. The molecular formula of this compound has got 19 carbons. And already we've got nine, so all we needed to do was add the remaining 10 carbons to show what followed on. So this is carbon nine, and now we've got some double bonds at position nine and position 12. And we've got 10 carbon, a chain of 10 to add on to here. So therefore, uh, if we go from here as position nine, then at position between 9 and 10, there is a double bond. There is then no double bond at position 11, but there's another double bond at position 12. Now, if we look at 9 and 10, the priority groups are on position 8 and position 11. So they're on the same side, the Z isomer. The next double bond is between position 12 and position 13. And again, its priority groups have to be on the same side. So here, the priority group are the carbon atoms here, not the invisible hydrogens here. So if we draw that out in full, position 9 and 10 is a double bond. There's nothing at 11. Position 12 and 13 is a double bond. And the priority groups here are on the same side and here both on the same side. This was an AS question and was a case of balancing equations. So we've got the ester and we need to completely combust it in oxygen. And whenever you've got a hydrocarbon or a carbohydrate, which this is, you're going to get carbon dioxide and you're going to get water. So work in the weight carbon, 19, so we've got 19 carbon dioxide, we've got 34 water, so we're going to need 34 over 2, which is 17 H2Os. And now we add up all the oxygens on this side, so if we add up all the oxygens on this side, this comes to 26 and a half O2s. A carbonyl compound if you look at your data sheet, has an absorption, an infrared absorption between 1680 to 1750 centimeters to minus one. However, if you look at carbon dioxide here, you can see that the absorption is actually so the double bond in carbon dioxide is at 2,350. So not what expected. And that's all you needed to write as long as you use the data book values and you read from the graph. The next question, how it causes global warming, you have to be very specific in mentioning that it's the C double bond O in carbon dioxide. So you had to mention the C double bond O bonds, it's the actual bonds that absorb IR, infrared radiation, at 2350. And not, like most organic compounds, at this value here between 1600 and 1700. And the way, um, so you needed to mention again the range or the value which I needed to quote if you've not already where it's absorbing. Now, what you needed to do is that infrared radiation admit, admit, so you needed to say here that the IR radiation emitted, so remember it's coming from the earth, don't talk about trapped. It's coming back off the earth. It doesn't go back into the atmosphere. And then what does that do? It's transferred 
to other molecules. So you needed to say here is the infrared radiation emitted from the Earth. But the word you had to get in here, it's the bonds of the carbon dioxide that are absorbing the infrared radiation. What students failed to recognise here was that NaBH4 is a source of hydride ions. Hydride ions. And immediately, if you put the lone pair on, you can see that hydride ions are nucleophiles because they have a lone pair of electrons. To see where the hydride ions are going to attack, Put your partial charges in to show your electron deficient carbon. Now this wasn't part of the mark scheme, but it helps you to understand the mechanism. The hydride ions therefore have a lone pair of electrons and they are forming a new bond with the electron deficient carbon and therefore a pair of electrons moves on to the oxygen atom. So the question was asking, why will the hydride ion not react with 2-methylbutene? And many students didn't draw the structure, and therefore it's hard to describe something if you can't see it. Remember, a picture paints a thousand words. So immediately you can see here that the hydride ion is attracted to the electron-deficient carbonyl group, where here you've got an electron-rich non-polar alkene group. So you can see by drawing it, if you look at the answer in the mark scheme, you can see that if you put on the partial charge, you can see why the hydride ion H- is attracted to the electron deficient carbon in the aldehyde. However, if the hydride ion goes near the electron rich carbon double bond carbon, it would actually be repelled because it's got a negative charge and there's an electron-rich area here. A picture paints a thousand words. Here again is an example where you need to visualise. So write the equation of ethanol reacting with cyanide ions to make 2-hydroxypropane nitrile. And don't guess the name of the mechanism because immediately you can see, because it's got a lone pair of electrons, it's a nucleophile. And the double bond has been broken. This has gone from an unsaturated molecule to a saturated. So the cyanide has added on. And therefore, it's quite simply a nucleophilic addition reaction. On this next part, you can see the definition is you have a mixture of equal amounts of two isomers. So from your definitions, immediately you should know that that is called a racemic mixture or a racemate. Easy mark. Now, very few students remembered the reason why looking at the mechanism. So here the mechanism is the explanation why you end up with an equal amount of the two isomers. So if you were to show the mechanism, so I'm going to represent the methyl group as R, the rest of the molecule. There's your carbonyl group in your aldehyde, which is trigonal planar. So it's a planar molecule. So now we're thinking in 3D. The cyanide ion can either attack from above the plane or the cyanide ion could attack from below the plane of the molecule. So again, use images. There are people trying to write lots and scored no marks because they failed to say that because the around this carbon atom here, it's planar and therefore the cyanide could attack from either the top or the bottom. And that then results in two enantiomers. Now, to draw your enantiomers, it's best to draw out the structure of the of the two of the products, and we know what the product is. It's here. It tells you it forms two hydroxypropane nitrile. So draw your two hydroxypropane nitrile first, and then you look for your 
chiral center, which is this carbon here. To draw your 3D representation, there is your mirror plane. Draw your tetrahedron. Two groups in the same plane, a group coming in out at you and one going behind. And therefore its mirror image is so behind the wedge is always the dotted line because you can't see this group. So let's now go to the 2-hydroxypropane nitrile. We have a hydrogen. So let's put the hydrogen in here and there's its mirror image. We have a nitrile group, a CN. So I, if I put the CN here, now on the mark scheme, it does show the mirror image. So I'm going to do it like that. Um, so we've got rid of that. We've now got a methyl group, so I'm going to put that here. It could have gone on the other one as long as you do its mirror image. And then we've got the hydroxy group, which I'm going to put here. So if it's OH there, it's OH there. So there were two marks to draw the two structures correctly. The first part of the question needed some working out. So you needed to, again, draw the structure of the 2-hydroxypropane nitrile to make this acrylonitrile molecule that they've given you the structure of. And what you can see is that this molecule here has simply lost a molecule of water. And therefore, we, need, we know it's a dehydration reaction of an alcohol. So this is the AS syllabus. So what can remove water from alcohols? Well, we know that we can either pass it over um, overheated aluminium oxide. And this is from your toolkit. So you need to go back to your organic toolkit and learn these reagents. So you've got hot and you pass the uh, you need to pass your 2-hydroxypropane nitrile over the heated Al2O3. Alternatively, um, you could and use a concentrated acid. And again, you need to know from your toolkit that you could pass it over concentrated sulfuric acid because that's a dehydrating agent or phosphoric acid. Now, if you're doing phosphoric acid, make sure you know the formula or write phosphoric acid. The students have lost marks because they got the formula of phosphoric acid wrong. So make sure you know the formula of the acid. So it makes wise when you're writing the name when you're writing reagents, write the name of the reagent. So here you can see that a molecule of water has been lost. So you didn't need this equation, but again it's wise to write out the structures so you can see the difference between the two and that it's a dehydration reaction. Again, if you draw the structure of the acrylonitrile, the structure of the monomer, you can clearly see that to form the addition polymer, all you do is to pop open the double bond. This is one repeating unit. So to do three repeating units, you simply had to write this out another two times with your nitrile group going down and your trailing bonds because remember this is a polymer so your trailing bonds here and here this first question for your multiple choice was a bog standard um le chatelier and you can see if you want to increase the concentration of that if you increase the concentration of the reactants it will move to oppose the change and therefore increase the concentration of oxygen it's going to move the system in this direction. So you're going to get more SO3 formed. Moving to the next question. Um, what you needed to do here was to, first of all, calculate the value for K using the data from experiment one. This calculation takes longer than a minute, but if I walk you through it, first of all, we need to find K from the first experiment to find the rate constant. So the rate constant here 
you rearrange the equation. So can you rearrange the first equation to get k on its own? You simply substitute the values, put that into your calculator, and k comes out to 8. Now you need, for the second experiment, to rearrange it again. So it's all about how quickly you can rearrange your rate equation. So q is the square root of rate divided by the concentration of p times k. So practice rearranging these equations. It's well worth it because it's a guaranteed mark. So when you, so there's the rate from experiment two. There is the concentration of P from experiment two. And there's K that we've already calculated. Take the square root of all that and it comes to 0.408. This next question will take less than one minute because you should already know that testing for carbonate ions you use an acid. The next question, again, should take less. It's just a case of recall. You know that um, aromatic compounds are attacked by electrophiles, so it has to be either this one or this one, and you know that the hydrogen gets substituted. So it's a nice, easy question. And the answer is electrophilic substitution. This one may take a little longer to decipher, but if you've learnt your toolkits, you should know this should be really easy to work out. So the first reaction here in the first step you can see is you're adding something on to the side chain here. So it's not to do with the benzene ring and it's an alkyl group. And the only thing that attacks alkyl groups are free radicals. So that is used in the synthesis so we can iron that out. The next thing is this halogenoalkane group is attacked and replaced by a nucleophile because we know nucleophiles attack halogenoalkanes. So it's nucleophilic. So nucleophilic substitution has gone, so it's not B or C. And if we look at the final reaction, you can see that the alcohol has undergone esterification. So alcohols behave as nucleophiles and they will attack acyl chlorides, that's nucleophilic addition elimination. So that leaves electrophilic substitution because the benzene ring hasn't been touched all the way through. Reading this question carefully, it says the reaction between propanoyl chloride and benzene is acylation. So which is the best, the correct representation of this part of the reaction? So remember, in acylation, you have the acyl group so, or the halogen carrier picking up a halogen. Immediately, you can see this is not correct because there is no lone pair. So definitely B is not correct. If we go to C, that could be correct because you can see a pair of electrons moving from the ring to the acylium ion. If we're trying to acylate something here, we're showing bond breaking. And here um, we see that the chlorine is giving a pair of electrons to the carbon atom. Well, that isn't going to produce a, an acylium ion. So the only probable answer is C. With this question, you couldn't guess. With, as with most organic, you need to draw out the structures. So we know that amines attack halogenoalkanes to produce secondary amines. Now, if the halogenoalkane is in excess, this lone pair can go on to attack further. So you could have attach two halogenoalkane groups. There's still a lone pair here, so that could go on to react to form the quaternary ammonium salt. So look for these stru three structures in your answers. There's one, there's one, there's one. The one that's not possible is D. You should have studied the all of these polymers and you know that Kevlar is an aramid, an aromatic amide. You can see that the nitrogen has a lone pair, got an electron deficient hydrogen so it's the only one that can have hydrogen bonding between its chains just like the aramids proteins Ar aramids were based on the structure of proteins and you can see that a amide link is the same as a peptide link which is 20 which is d ph14 as you know means there are lots of hydroxide ions around 
And if there's lots of hydroxide ions around, any proton that can be lost will be lost. And therefore, it's the structure which is least protonated, which is D.